Welcome back to Oakhaven. We woke up this morning to a winter wonderland. You know, we've been very fortunate. Uh, since we've lived on this property for the last 20 some years, uh, I've been self-employed working from the home. So on a day like this, generally, I don't need to go out on the road. I don't need to fight traffic. I don't need to fight people slipping around on ice. I get to stay here and walk through the woods. So we thought we'd let you uh, walk with us today. One of the nice things about walking in the winter is that you can see forever, which is always nice. You don't have the leaves getting in the way. You can kind of get a feel for the lay of the land. You also have snow blanketing everything, which right now is covering up some of the non-native invasives. <laughs> so I don't have to be thinking about like, oh, this cancer is spreading across the land. Right now it's kind of a pure slate, which is a, it's a nice feeling. As we're walking along, you, you see the, the, the promise of spring. We've got a lot of spice bush. That's probably the predominant shrub that we have through and growing through here um, with these almost perfectly round buds promising the, the yellow flowers in the spring and then the red fruit coming up in the, uh, in the summer. Uh, we'll be looking forward to that. See, I'm, it's... Uh, Beautiful out right now, and I'm already thinking about when it's going to be warm. We have a lot of these black cherry trees that are dying. And I was concerned that it might be some sort of uh, disease, but my understanding from our state forester is that just black cherry trees are kind of early successional trees and they they won't grow in the shade very well so um, as the as the forest matures uh, we will lose some of these things which is unfortunate but it's all part of the process often when we find trees and shrubs and plants that have leaves on them in the winter i say it's because they're confused they don't belong here this is a a tree that actually belongs here and it still keeps its leaves. Now this is an American beech. You can see that it holds on to its leaves, uh, meaning that they don't, uh, nothing happens physiologically to make them fall off. So they will hold on to their leaves until they physically get knocked around by the, the um, wind and get blown off. Beech had these great buds, these long pointed buds. Uh, if, you, if you've seen our our winter tree identification videos, we talk about how uh, the beach, uh, we learned that is uh, don't smoke cigars at the beach because it looked like a cigar-shaped bud, very long. So that's a beach tree. It's great to hike on a day where the snow is on the ground, it's covering the, the trees, and it has a beautiful blue sky. But this is cool too, to be walking with the snow falling. Just really feel like you're a part of what's going on. It is true, when you walk through our woods, you can see off in the distance, and often what you see in the distance these days is downed trees. There's a couple of downed cherry trees, like what we were talking about, and this big ash tree, a lot of dead ash trees here. If you scan over this way, you can see it's just, it's sad to think about all those trees that are no longer there. Fortunately, we had a lot of other trees so that when we lost all of our, our ash trees, there were other trees around. It wasn't like we were completely without forest. Um, we know of a lot of people who basically lost every tree in their yard when the ash trees died. Uh, so hopefully uh, everything else is going to fill in and uh, we will restore our woods here. So this beech tree is a little bigger than the one we were looking at before. 
It shows how it's held onto its leaves. Uh, it's called marcescence when it holds onto its leaves. Beech trees do that. Um, the oak trees do that. Uh, the a lot of the birches, uh, hornbeam, hop hornbeam, uh, hold onto their leaves. Uh, no one's exactly sure why it holds onto its leaves like that. Uh, it's been suggested that it it protects the winter buds a little bit. Um, I kind of like the theory that the it protects them from browsing because deer walking through here are less likely to to eat these leaves that are not very pleasant. So they're they're not going to eat the buds off. Um, but no one has any, any proof as to why that is. So here's another one of those marcescent trees that we talked about. This is a white oak. You can see it's holding onto its leaves also and dumping snow all over me. We talk about this marcescence where the trees keep their leaves through the winter. This is a sugar maple tree. Normally you wouldn't think of a maple tree as keeping its leaves, but this one seems to have. The reason for that is probably because there was a freeze that caused these leaves to die before the abscission layer, the little layer that, uh, that grows between the stem and the branch that, uh, that allows the branch or the, the leaf to fall off. It was probably killed before that had formed. So this had never gotten to the point where it developed the abscission layer and fell off. So now it's stuck on here until some mechanical means knocks it off. Whenever I'm out walking in the, the weather like this, and we definitely have weather here with the snow falling, it's actually slowed down a little bit since we started. I think of John Muir out in Yosemite Valley, who used to like to climb the trees, the, the big pine trees, during a big storm and hold on to the top so he could feel the, the push and the shove and the, the wind and just just become a part of, of the whole system that was out there. I always thought that was a little crazy. So this is my mild version of that, being out here and, and appreciating weather as it's happening. We can talk about some of the other trees that are out here. Uh, we don't need the leaves on some of these for, for identifying. This is hackberry. Hackberry is identifiable by these ridged bark. It's, it's all in layers. Uh, looks kind of like you're riding through the Grand Canyon with all those sedimentary layers there. Um, kind of cool. Next to it here is a black locust. Black locust, I always feel like the, uh, like it was the Incredible Hulk, that the, the trunk grew up and it just was splitting this, this bark, uh, forming these big fissures that run kind of uh, uh, in figure eights down the, the stump. The evergreen tree that we have above us catching all of this, this snow is the eastern uh, red cedar, or uh, Juniperus virginiana. Uh, it's pretty much the only evergreen that we have native on our property. It tends to collect all of this snow. When we get a big heavy snowfall, these things will get way down and they'll bend over like halfway to the ground sometimes if we get enough snow. Uh, and I always think, oh, we're going to lose all the, the cedars, uh, but they don't. Uh, the snow melts off and they pop back up and uh, they seem to survive pretty well. Cedars are an early stage, an early cereal stage uh, tree. So they, they came in when it was sunny. Again, they're not going to last very long as the tree, as the forest uh, matures and grows up, uh, but they're pretty dominant right now. This is a dogwood. You can see it breaks off, the, the um, bark breaks off in these scales. So they're all kind of almost circular little scales. Each scale is cupped, so it's lowest in the middle. Uh, differentiates it from a black haw, which has kind of a similar looking bark, but the, uh, the each scale is, is concave or convex. So it, it actually is higher in the middle. Uh, you can tell The uh, dogwood is an opposite branched tree. So there's two branches that come out. This one had a branch there and another one there, it's broken off. You often see that here. You can see where there was a branch here and it was opposite, but one of the branches is broken off. But if you look in, up at the tree, a lot of them are, are opposite. Here we have a tulip poplar. Tulip poplars go straight 
often don't have a lot of branches at the bottom. You can see if you look up at the top, you can see some of the tulips formed by the seeds up towards the top. They'll hold on onto those for a while. So straight and tall, um, fairly easy to split. Tulip poplar was a, a very popular tree to be used for uh, log cabins in early settler time. You could cut them up and split them into uh, rails for fences or for cabins. Uh, it's a nice tree. Real obvious tree here. Look at the thorns on this guy. This is a honey locust. Really obvious from the thorns. Also has this bark that just is peeling off. It looks like it's kind of curved and like somebody has tried to peel it off. It's a honey locust. When we talk about things that are green, evergreen, this is green, but not in the same way. This is a box elder, and if you look at the stems, first of all, here's a lesson. Don't look up into a tree and then shake the branches. <coughs> the, uh, the young stems of box elder are green all through the winter, and you can see that as a box elders are a maple, maples are opposite branched, so you can see the opposite branching on most of these here. So that's a box elder. Often you can find the little Samaras, the little helicopters that are held on through the winter in the uh, box elder. I don't see any right now. This is a mussel wood. Unfortunately, it's not particularly healthy and there weren't a lot of leaves. Uh, mussel wood is one of those that keeps its leaves through the winter. So you can see it still has leaves here and scattered up through the, the top it has leaves. The name musclewood comes from the fact that if you look at the bark, it has this very smooth bark that's in striations. It looks like, like a flexed muscle. It's also called American hornbeam, but I like musclewood better because it's easier to remember. It's in the birch family. Related to the American hornbeam, or musclewood, is this tree, which is American hop hornbeam, also in the birch family, and also it tends to keep its leaves through the winter. So you can see the leaves on here with little tufts of snow on them. But when you look at the bark on this, it is not the smooth and sinuous look. I mean, this is pretty young, so it's pretty much together. Um, but the bark is... Um, will will form like strings. I'll show you a, a bigger one later, but that's uh, American hop hornbeam or ironwood. I like the term ironwood, except that there's a number of things that are called ironwood, so it gets kind of confusing. So we'll go with musclewood for that one, and we'll call this one American hop hornbeam. So that here, we have the, the more mature bark of the ironwood or the American hop hornbeam, and you can see it's just it's flaking off and comes off in, in strings, kind of. Um, that's a ironwood or American hop hornbeam. And actually, if you look up in the top, not only do you see the, the leaves that are covered with snow, but you see the little uh, seed capsules that are covered with snow. Okay, so we have a, a muscle wood here, and I'd like to show you the seed pods. And unfortunately, on a lot of these things, they're never close <coughs> to the ground so that it's easy to get to. So I'm going to do my best at trying to get this branch down. Okay. So here's the seed pods. And you can see that each of these bracts is kind of arrow shaped or hastate <clears throat> with a seed in the middle. One one little leaflet there. 
Okay, that's, and here's a whole group of them. You get that? Mm -hmm. Well, that's muscle wood. So here we have an Ohio buckeye. Ohio buckeyes are opposite, okay? Like the maples and the ashes. But they also have this huge bud, this huge terminal bud. So that's Ohio buckeye. Buckeye, I think the, the bark, I talk about tree of heaven as having a bark that looks a little bit like a cantaloupe skin. I think that buckeye also has a bark that looks a little like a cantaloupe skin. So the black locust, black locust gets these diagnostic shelf fungi on them. These happen to be little shelves of, of snow. Uh, or this was a black locust, it is dead now. I guess it's still a black locust. And there's um, Virginia creeper growing up it. There was an interesting discussion on one of the Facebook groups a few days ago, talking about if you remove all the non-native plants that produce berries, like the honeysuckles and the autumn olives, uh, what is it that the, the native plants, or native plants, native birds and native animals will have to eat because you've taken away those things that hold on to their fruit for a long time? Now, obviously, the birds and the animals have something that they can eat um, because they were doing fine before the, the non-natives who were here. But I was, they were talking about options for, for planting things that had berries in the winter. And uh, I was thinking about grapevine. The grapevine produces a lot of fruit. And most of it is up there in the, the canopy right now. Um, but it holds on to it for a long time. It's, it's pretty picked over right now. But grapevine is a, is a great source of a lot of fruit. But when I look at something like this huge grapevine here, growing up the sycamore tree, and you realize the grapevines don't climb like Virginia creeper, where it grabs onto the, brand, or the, uh, the trunk and works its way up the, the trunk. Grapevine basically tangles around things. So, for this grapevine to get that high up in the tree, it had to get tangled up in those branches when the sycamore tree was just a little sapling. And then as the tree grew, it worked its way up. But it did not just grow up from the base. You can see that this is actually rooted six feet away from the base of that trunk. So, grapevine grows very differently from other things, but it gives you an appreciation for how old this grapevine must be if it's all the way up in the top of the sycamore. So when we talk about fruit in the winter, we have some other vines up here. Whoa! So this is, this is common greenbrier. And you can see the fruit that are growing on that. So the, the birds and the animals can eat that. That's a native fruit. Okay. This is, we haven't talked too much about non-native plants, but there is a Japanese honeysuckle growing up in here. And it also is in fruit. It is interesting that both the native greenbrier and the non-native Japanese honeysuckle, which have kind of a similar looking fruit, both are in fruit here, and neither of them are being eaten very much. But there's a lot of greenbrier fruit up here waiting for some birds to come and, and feed on it. Here's we were trying to find the fruit of the, the um, hop horn beam and the horn beam. This is neither, this is the sycamore. But it, it gave me an appreciation for the fact that, that when I'm looking for fruit and leaves and things like that, everything is way up in the trees. So fortunately, this is a, a sycamore fruit that is broken off and has fallen down so it's close enough that we can get to it. You can actually see the, um, as long as we're talking about fruit, you can see the fruit of the dogwood here too. Thanks for coming along with us on this walk through this winter wonderland. Uh, hopefully we learned something as we walked along. Um, if you liked this, hit the like button. Uh, we always appreciate new subscribers. Other than that, thanks for coming.